All right, we're on page 14, and I'm going to speak a little bit of Hashem. In the bottom paragraph, says Rabbeinu Avraham, yesterday he mentioned to us about the different paths of serving Hashem, and how you obviously see that there are different levels of quality, even between the higher levels of serving Hashem. And he says here, Val pi hamashal hazeh, the above is an example, Tidba'er nashar da'chayichidim, in order for you to understand the other paths that people will take in other mitzvot. For example, the idea of kashrut, keeping kosher. Keeping kosher is not all about just what you can't, what you can or cannot put in your mouth on a halachic level. There are ideas behind the mitzvah of kashrut also. Because obviously you cannot compare one whose intimate approach to machalot asurot, forbidden foods, it only brings him to this point, I understand the value of eating like a, like a, a spiritual person, like a Jew, like a holy person. That value is, I won't get drunk when I drink wine, and I won't stuff myself with meat. I mean, that's the, his lofty level. Well, are you allowed to stuff yourself with meat according to Jewish law? No. Well, is it not kosher? Oh, there's no... There's no, there's no oh, kashrut that. prohibition here, but when a person realizes that kashrut is meant to limit what goes into my mouth and to refine the things that I eat on a physical level, food is a very physical, mundane thing. But when you turn that into a sense of refinement, <laughs> and when a person goes to a restaurant and orders six main courses for themselves, it's all glad kosher. But his actions are not refined. So he's, he's maybe following the common road of kashrut, but on an intimate level, he's saying, my intimate level, my extra that I'm doing is I won't get drunk, and I won't stuff myself with meat. It's true. He did take a step higher than what he has to do. But you can't compare him to the Mishihigiyana to one who reached the level where the Talmud says about him in Tractate Brachot, Dayo Bekav Charuvin, Me'erav Shabbat, Le'erav Shabbat. He's able to eat just a kav. A kav is a small measurement of caribs from one Friday till the next Friday. <laughs> now, fasting is not necessarily a Jewish value. But to the point where most of your nourishment comes from learning Torah, from, from tefillah, from doing mitzvot. And you eat. You eat not necessarily caribs, but you eat just what you need to keep going further in your life. That's already a very lofty level of, of piety. It's not the ascetism, uh, is that the word, the proper word? It's not the abstaining from food yes, it that makes you holy. It's, right, it's not asceticism that's, that's making you the holy person. It's the fact that you're able to say, I'm only going to eat the things I need to eat that are good for me to eat. He mentioned before, Rabbi Avam, the things that are healthy for you to eat. It's, there are things that are not healthy that are kosher. So you're not violating the laws of kashrut by eating them. But a person who truly understood the, the intimate road would say, I also want to make, take care to eat the things that are healthier for me or that are better for me. And therefore my Avodat Hashem will be longer because I'll live on this earth longer. And uh, these calculations would make a person on a much higher intimate road than the one who's on the intimate road of, I won't get drunk when I drink my kiddush wine. Good for you. Yeah. Now but that's a big deal for some people. There are some people, and I've been noticing this more and more, Baruch Hashem, not in our community as much, people have a serious problem with alcohol. And it's, it's not just with hard alcohol, but I even noticed that it could be at my Shabbat table that one person will finish a whole bottle of wine on their own. And that's a, that's a forget refinement, and forget, it's not a, a, a normal, healthy thing for a person to drink like that. And it, there must be underlying problems of trying to run away from something, and it's a, that's what alcohol is generally used for. But, yeah, the wine was kosher, it even had three hechshers on the bottle but it doesn't make the actions kosher. And so there's a certain level of, of and this might be a high level for somebody, I mean, I'm not going to get drunk every Friday night. It's become a thing in some circles, where at weddings they have an open bar, and the people like to show off, yeah, how much money? This open bar cost me $13,000. You just threw $13,000 down the drain. on yeah. giving people alcohol <laughs> that you don't even know, they don't even care about you, and you just spent, on one night you blew $13,000? You could have bought the couple a new car. You could have done something useful with that money. You could have. But you chose not to. But you then come to such a wedding, and it's not a not normal thing for me. It's not uncommon for me to be at a wedding, and the second dance, half the people are falling over the chairs, and they're drunk, and they stink like alcohol. For what? That's a Jewish wedding? That's what it looks like? That's what a, a holy place is supposed to look like? 
the fact that you can go to a Simchat Torah and I'm not speaking about denominations, it's already become a non-denominational problem. And alcohol has become synonymous with Simchat Torah. I'm not talking here about Purim. Purim, you're not allowed to drink on Purim. Drunk, definitely not allowed to get drunk on Purim. There are sources to back up those people who get drunk on Purim. They're right. They're right. That's why I can't fight this fight. But on Simchat Torah, there are no sources about alcohol. Nothing to do with alcohol. Afuch. The whole idea of Simchat Torah, what is the idea of Simchat Torah? Celebrating? The giving of the, the Torah. Giving of the Torah. What does that have to do with alcohol? In fact, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov points out that every time you find wine mentioned in the Torah or they intoxication... Even, they didn't even drink it when they were giving the Torah. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> every time you find wine in intoxication in the Torah, it's always followed by... Um. Like, like a sin. Sin, bad news. Yeah. Noach, we just read about this. Noach and drinking. And this is a real problem. And when you go to a Simchat Torah celebration and people are passed out on the floor or they're just falling over their chairs, it's a crazy thing. Those poskim who mentioned drinking on Purim, for example, those poskim who mentioned drinking on Purim, even drinking to a point of slight intoxication, they mention one requirement, which is why my opinion is that even if you hold like those rabbis that say you have to get drunk on Purim, I don't know one person who fulfills the obligation. The obligation is you're only allowed to fulfill the mitzvah of drinking, according to them, of getting drunk on Purim, if you promise that you will not violate any other mitzvah by being drunk on Purim. So imagine this. Imagine this. How many people who get drunk by their Purim meal say Berkat HaMazon with Kavanah? It's a biblical mitzvah. The whole holiday of Purim is rabbinic. How many of them pray Mincha and Arvit when they're already sober? How you're not allowed to pray when you're drunk. A rabbi say that one who prays when he's intoxicated is as if he worshipped an idol. So he can't pray when he's sober. He doesn't have time. Or who says that he's not going to say some stupid thing that will disrespect himself or he's not going to hurt somebody else or he's not going to say Lashon Hara or he's not going to curse. All kinds of people think come out of them when they get drunk. Or, or even Simcha Torah. He's just drank a little bit, but now he can't really dance, so he's sitting on the chair. You're sitting on the chair when the Torah is going by you? That's also a prohibition. The Torah is walking by you. Are you sitting in the chair? What are you sitting in the chair for? The general is walking by you. You stand up, how much more so the Torah? Can you imagine what it would look like if you sat on the chair and somebody walks by you with the Torah? It's a crazy thing. And so there's not one person that I know, or that you know, that has the right to ever reach a point of even slight intoxication. Just there are too many halachot that are being broken by that that they could not even... There's nothing good that can come out of it. And I told you this is a non-denominational problem. This is not just, so, oh, but why are you talking about the Hasidim? It's not Hasidim. In fact, I can tell you one thing. In my experience, Hasidim have a culture of drinking to the point where, even though you have crazy people that are Hasidim that are drinking, but... I don't know why, but it seems like the more a person drinks, the more they can somehow retain their alcohol. And I've actually seen people be more drunk and disgusting in non Hasidic communities. Because this is the... Hey, once a year we're going to break all the rules. That's what it turns out to be. And it's a crazy thing. Forget the law. What about law? There's legalities involved. Serving alcohol in public places. There's children that are drinking under... And children, I don't mean 10 years old. I mean someone who's, who's 18 years old is not allowed to drink in this country. And the rabbis are looking the other way. It's a problem. This is a problem. And the fact that the Jewish community won't grab this problem by the horns and, and they're going to cloak it with religiosity and halakha and the spirit of the holiday, it's a spirit of Shabbat. It's a crazy thing. And it's something that you have to be ver- vocal about. You can't just be quiet about it. When I was a rabbi in Yerushalayim, and people would bring me a bottle, of, it was a nice thing, and to bring a nice bottle of scotch or whiskey, or, I would say, please leave it outside the door and take it home when you leave. What are you, a Mormon? I'm not a Mormon. I'm just a rabbi. I, I don't understand what this has to do with the Shabbat meal. Rabbi, you're such a party pooper. Well, maybe I am. Maybe I am. I don't know. Could be. But you have to have an attitude, or else or else it's, the problem will keep going and going and going. It can't be that I read stories on the Internet about somebody who kicked their alcohol habit when they were in their teens, and they went to AA, and they've been successful, and then they became observant, and they joined the community, and that's where their alcohol problem started again. It, it, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know how else to say this. And so we must be vocal about it. And if you're not vocal about it, you're, it's guilty by association, guilty by silence. It's a problem. The Rambam, Rabbeinu Avraham, is suggesting kosher is not just about what it says in the label. 
It's how you use this food. It's what you do with it. It's how you, you bring into your body. It's what kind of things. It might be kosher according to the law, but not according to all kinds of other things. Someone asked me recently, what about the certain factory that was found in, in a certain country that was abusing the animals? Before? The kosher, the rabbis slaughtering, but, but the rabbis were doing their job. But the people who owned the factory and the, and the they were throwing chickens across the room. Like, Are you allowed to eat such food? Now, technically, it's kosher. They did the right slaughtering. They checked if bones were broken. That's true. But on an ethical level, ethical, I'm not saying a humane level because animals are not humans. It's a mistaken word to use. On, on the Torah, one of the biblical prohibitions is that you cannot abuse animals. You're allowed to kill animals. You are allowed to. You are even allowed to eat animals that you kill. But to abuse them, you're not allowed to. And so, does that mean that they're not kosher? I don't know if it means that they're not kosher, but there's another biblical prohibition on that meat, and it's a problem. Rabbi Avraham continues, and he says, Adin. And this is the same thing. It's probably better that we don't run into this because it'll take us to the second paragraph and then we'll be getting ahead. So to summarize what Rabbeinu Avraham told us, Rabbeinu Avraham is saying that not everything that is on the intimate road is created equal. There might be people who have a loftier intimate road than other people who are on an intimate path. And the beauty of Judaism is that there are different paths, there are different roads, but there are levels and there are levels and, and steps that you have to take I started writing a book a while back and I didn't finish it. I'll probably be on the time one day I'll finish. My hope was to title it Judaism is not a democracy. What I mean by it is, you know, you can't you can't go to a co ed gym and um, uh, flirt with ladies by kiddush and then you're gonna send your kids to, to a school that teaches them all kinds of terrible things and then do your Friday night meal according to the deepest Kabbalistic ideas of the Ben Yishchai. Okay, the Ben Yishchai wrote a path for individuals who had already completed the common road. The common road is you have to take care of your children's education, you have to make sure that you're guarding your eyes, you're doing things that you're not you're not talking to somebody else's wife, so on and so forth, and then you're allowed to start walking around the table with six hadasim and to do everything the Ben Yishchai tells you. Judaism is not a democracy. You don't have the right to skip rungs on the ladder. There are certain things that have a parents does. I would love to do them. I'm not allowed to. I'm not there yet. Bezal Hashem, one day we'll all get there. 